नमस्कार हेलो एंड वेलकम टू सनसेट टीवी आई एम टीना झा यू वाचिंग पर्सपेक्टिव द शो वेयर वी डिस्कस एंड एनालाइज इश्यूज पर्टिनेंट टू इंडिया एंड द वर्ल्ड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट इंडियाज पॉपुलेशन ग्रोथ नाउ अकॉर्डिंग टू द नेशनल फैमिली हेल्थ सर्वे डेटा फॉर 2019 2021 द कंट्रीज पॉपुलेशन इज सेट टू फॉल एज इट्स टोटल फर्टिलिटी रेट which is the average number of children born to a woman over her lifetime has dropped to 2 for the first time ever in the 2015-16 survey the national tfr was 2.2 and before that in the 2005-6 survey it was 2.7 now it has dropped down to 2 which is below replacement level the replacement level uh, of tfr at which a population exactly replaces itself from one generation to the next one is estimated to be 2.1 The findings suggest that TFR has declined to 2.1 in rural areas and 1.6 in the urban areas. So on the show today we will analyze the key findings of the latest NFHS survey what it means for India the challenges before the country as TFR falls and the way forward. To discuss these and related aspects I have with me a distinguished set of panel so let me first introduce them to you joining me in the studio is Poonam Mutreja she is executive director population foundation of india and joining us virtually are two eminent panelists as well dr s k singh he is professor and head department of mathematical demography and statistics international institute for population sciences and dr j k bajaj director center for policy studies thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program today Dr Singh so since IIPS was the nodal agency that conducted the latest survey let me begin the program with your first comments on what a declining TFR means for India is it an indication that the population of India is now stabilizing yes in this amrit mahotsav when the country is on celebrating amrit mahotsav in the current year this is a really great news for the country that after 74 years of independence we have entered in the stage where population has already achieved replacement level but reaching replacement level fertility does not mean population stabilization you have rightly explained that a couple having tfr of 2.0 means a woman during her entire lifetime she is producing two children and that leads towards population stabilization subsequently after accounting for population momentum we anticipate that around 30 to 35 years time will be required for population stabilization from where population will start declining if we are able to maintain this how it has happened is most important when we released nfhs four result in 1516 Uh, uh, it was noticed that contraceptive prevalence was almost stagnant for a decade from 2005-6 to 15-16. Mm-hmm. After that, government of India has started Mission Parivar Vikas. Uh, during last five years, there has been tremendous progress in efficiency and effectiveness of our family planning program, which has resulted into increase from 53%. to 67% which is almost optimum for any country with the given demographic models to achieve the replacement level fertility india has been able to now question is to sustain it Absolutely. only three major states that's bihar with 2 3.0 up with 2.4 and jharkhand with 2.3 these are the three states where we are having slightly above replacement level fertility and two smaller states meghalaya 2.9 and manipur 2.2 all together only five states is having this certainly so how we are going to sustain it what are the challenges i'll come back to you and understand all of that let me let me take the comments also from punam mutreja and try and understand from the 1950s when india had a tfr of around 6 to now in 2020 we have brought it down to 2 and what's remarkable is that we have managed to do it without any coercive measure unlike china which also had a tfr of 6 in the 1950s but all of us know it brought about a one child norm which it implemented for quite a num- number of decades so how do you look at it what it means for our population growth so for india to do it without coercion is a great achievement let's first recognize that and especially when we compare ourselves to china and the country is worried we are going to overtake china we are going to overtake china with dignity 
with freedom and with uh, without coercion. So that's something to celebrate too, along with the fact that we've reached replacement level. Second, I'd like to say that it is an achievement for women of India that they not only decided they want not more than two children, but they are managing to exercise their rights in spite of a very patriarchal framework and family planning not being totally accessible. I agree with uh, Professor Singh that some efforts have been made thanks to Mission Parivar, but that's only in 140 districts, but rightly so in high fertility districts. Second, I'd like to say that, you know, the media has played a big role in exposing the poor and the other half uh, to the fact on how the better half lives with fewer children, investing in their education, investing in women's health, um, women uh, uh, also practicing the number of ch desired fertility, which is less than two in India and has been for some time. So the other half knows how the better half lives and they've decided they want fewer children, they want to invest in their education. And finally, I don't think we recognize the role that inflation, food inflation has pay, play, played. You know, 90% of the expenditures of Indians is on food, especially the poor, and they cannot afford to feed more than two people. And finally, I'd like to say that uh, India investing in more methods definitely has helped and there has been some behavior change communication which the government has done, other organizations have done and PFI where I work has played a big role in our serial Me Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hoon which focuses on family planning and reached the media dark areas and there are others who have done in Bihar especially, you know, Bihar, UP, I've seen a lot of behavior change, communication and uh, changing social norms. So India has arrived at the possibility of people exercising their not just rights, but their aspirations have changed. And this is the new India with different aspirations. So, and we've come a long way and it is something to celebrate. So a big demographic landmark uh, that Puna Mutreja is saying, Dr. Bajaj. So in this, obviously, what both our guests have been saying, there have been coordinated efforts from different agencies. So if we look at, obviously, the population control measures by the government, India has been the first country in the world which launched the National Family Planning Program back in 1952. Consistent efforts have been made it, and they have been sustained as well through the decades. What kind of a role has the National Family Program, Family Planning Program played in bringing us to this demographic landmark that we are talking about today? Uh, Tina, uh, it is indeed a great landmark that we have achieved. And... Uh, in achieving this kind of landmarks in a society in a large nation like India, the state, of course, has a major role. Uh, but ultimately, it's the people of India, both the women and the men, who have moved in a certain direction, who have, <laughs> developed, have got more educated, have seen better things, better access to things, which is led us to this landmark. And I should emphasize that uh, we were moving towards this landmark for several years now. Yes. Uh, last year, I think 2020 uh, July, there was an uh, analysis in the Lancet, which predicted by that by 2017, given the trends, India would reach replacement levels. Uh, of fertility, and of course, many other nations it was uh, suggesting. So this is something which was on the cards. In fact, it has been the cards since 1950, because if you look at the growth rates of population, uh, the our population, decadal population growth rate started coming down by, uh, by the third decade of independence from 81, 91, from decade to decade, our growth rates have been declining and considerably declining. So this is a process that has gone on from the 50s till today. Mm -hmm. And 
this is a very positive process. We needed a certain level of growth in the population after the colonial phase passed. Uh, and now that we have reached a certain level, we have uh, started moving towards stabilizing the population. I want to make one more point before we come to other issues. Uh, 2.1 is said to be the replacement rate, which means that uh, for every father and every mother, there's a child. There's a child for the father, there's a child for the mother. Yes. And you add 0.1 for wasted children who die early. Yes. So 2.1 is the replacement rate in societies where infant mortality under five mortality is low or reasonably low. Uh, in India, uh, under five mortality is coming right. down, but is still fairly it's high. Still there, yes. And for a society at this level of in under five mortality, replacement rate would have been reached uh, when we reached 2.2. Uh, so uh, we should remember that we are passing through a process and every aspect of demography has to be looked into and our next target should be having achieved this that let us drastically lower the neonatal uh, uh, death rates, neonatal mortality, uh, infant mortality, under five mortality, so that in those numbers also we should start looking like a country that has arrived. Certainly. We'll certainly do it. Maybe it's a matter of another five years. Absolutely. We'll do it. I think that should be our next target. Professor Singh, so now that we have achieved this uh, landmark, the big challenge that you mentioned earlier was now to sustain it. The question that I want to ask you is, how low can the TFR in any country go to until it becomes a cause of concern? And this is one problem we have seen in countries like Europe, where they are now struggling with this rapid decline in TFR. Thank you, Gina. Thanks for this raising very important question. Even if you look at our NFHS 5 results, states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala, where TFR in NFHS 4 was 1.6, there is a marginal increase from 1.6 to 1.8. That is why anything below 1.6 is slightly problematic to maintain or to sustain for a longer period. And that is primarily because of population momentum. Many European countries have also seen, but our challenges are different. For example, the most important challenge is in one hand, we are celebrating the achievement, this achievement of TFR 2.0. At the same time, the teenage motherhood, adolescent motherhood is a real challenge for our country. Yes. Okay. And particularly seven states, those, uh, especially let me talk about five states first. That's Assam, Tripura, West Bengal, Bihar and Jharkhand. These are the five states where age at marriage is very low. Our program is able to contain the growth by focus at female sterilization. But for these younger women who are marrying before legal, minimum legal age at marriage of 18 years, we are not having able to promote a spacing method of contraception. That is why we are not able to delay their first pregnancy, resulting into Early child, early, yeah, resulting into teenage motherhood, adolescent fertility, which Dr. Bajaj was uh, mentioning, is one of the prime cause for maternal and child mortality. Early childhood mortality also key drivers, and maternal mortality ratio also key driver. Of okay. course, on maternal health, Tinaji, it is extremely important that India has made such a tremendous progress that we are estimating, we are projecting with the help of various artificial intelligence techniques that India may achieve a SDG goal for maternal and child health well before 2030. But with incre increasing institutional births, C-section is another challenge. Increasing proportion of C-section deliveries, especially in private health facility, is beyond any medical explanation in our country. Okay, okay. That's one of since, another prime concern. Not Kunal, only since he's talking about women's health in our country, and which of yeah. course is a cause of concern, 
one one finding that uh, particularly caught my attention attention was that the burden of contraception and that the survey suggests is still lies majorly on women how concerning is that what needs to be done to ensure that the burden of contraception is shared equally among men and women so um that's why in the beginning i said it's an achievement for men uh, women uh, this uh, um, uh, fertility rate going to 2 because our men are not participating in taking responsibility yes. for family planning it is primarily women if you look at uh, uh, sterilization it's less than 0.54 men in india in fact it's gone down to 0.3 while m m women go through 75% of the women go through um, and not only use different contraceptives but sterilization the burden entirely falls on women um, in fact there are sur the surveys show that men consider it women's responsibility for family planning so i joke sometimes that women live with the fear of producing uh, getting pregnant when they don't want to get pregnant when they have sex or end up basically uh, sex is for reproduction while for men it just pleasure and they do not use contraceptives like condoms and um, go through vasectomy because they feel their libido their pleasure will be affected what about women so i think we need going forward while we absolutely i agree with the, uh, uh, dr bajaj and professor singh we need to focus on and reducing maternal mortality child mortality but the biggest thing we need to do is put the burden and make of not the burden but the responsibility, the responsibility yes. of family planning on men men have to step up in this country it is too patriarchal a society where the women not only have the privilege yes of being able to deliver which men don't have of babies but men neither take responsibility for um, contraception and nor for child care i think these are things going forward especially if we want to avoid what you were discussing with dr singh minus growth rates like europe we need women friendly um equality we need women friendly policies not just in family planning but we need to change mindsets of men Behavioral and changes have to be workplace there, yes. we need to give women opportunities to be able to work and reduce their caregiving role women's caregiving role as we saw even during covid has exponentially increased and women are having for being forced to step out of the workforce and i always say the biggest impediment is um, a caregiving role of women and finally i also want to say in that context that education is the best pill and education putting women in um um not just primary school high school college education not only will it empower families but that's the best family planning um contraceptive there is nothing and i think nothing better than that and i think the fact we've reached to um, where we've reached is also because more women are getting educated okay, okay. we know that globally if women do class 12 they are likely to have less than two or two children but if they have less education they are likely to have more children so what we need to do many things and this is a good time for india to invest in women but men need to invest in being more responsible and take more responsibility absolutely dr bajaj poonam ji made a very valid point that development is the best contraception for long what we have seen is our policy makers and a number of experts came saying that our population size is the biggest hurdle biggest roadblock when we talk about the country's development now with the tfr declining and in the coming 35 to 40 years our population finally declining do you think a uh, population will no longer be the hindrance towards development that is often talked about uh, as far as i think population should never be seen as a hindrance it will be seen as a resource and certainly now that we have reached at the level of 2.0 replacement level all the population that we have today each person each woman each man is an asset for the country none of them should, should be seen as a liability it is our duty development means that every person born becomes an asset for the nation yes. 
But uh, Tina, I want to raise one more issue in this context, which is significant. Uh, India, of course, has achieved uh, uh, this fertility rate TFR of replacement level as a whole. Uh, but uh, uh, India is not a single population. There we have uh, groups within India. And there, there are several issues of concern which need to be highlighted. Uh, one of the major issues of concern is that uh, uh, if you look at the uh, NHS 4, the TFR, it gives you the TFR of Hindu, Sikhs, uh, and uh, Jains, Buddhists, and Muslims. Already in NHS, NHFS 4, uh, Hindus, Muslims, uh, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, were all below 2.1. All uh, it was Muslims were at 2.6. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, uh, diff gap you see recently Pew uh, did a major study on Indian religious demography, and one of the things they pointed out is was that you control for all parameters, control for education, control for wealth, household wealth, control for urban rural, control for age, and you still end up with a difference of about 30% in the fertility of uh, Muslims and the Hindus. Now, that difference, uh, now that we are going to become a stringing population, Lancet's estimate is that by the end of the century, uh, we will be 30 crores short of what we are today a population instead of 1.3 crore, uh, 130 crores, will be 100 crores. Yes. Now, uh, if the pro process of this differential fertility remains, uh, then the ratio of different communities in that 100 crores can be very different than what uh, we have today. And that should be a matter which needs to be flagged. In fact, the Lancet study also shows that while Indian population will decline by 30 crores compared to what it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, the population of Pakistan will increase by 3 crores in the same period from here. Professor Singh will be able to shed light on it that the levels of literacy define the TFR in more concrete terms as compared to religion. Exactly. I also have this opinion that if you look at the religious differences, most important factor is education. Yes. Most important factor is poverty. Even if you look at NFHS 4 or NFHS 5 figures, the differential between illiterate and those who are 12 or more years of schooling, differential between those who are lowest wealth quintile and those who are in the highest wealth quintile, those differentials are more pronounced than religious differentials. Hindu, Muslim, both fertility is declining. This is another thing that yes, bearing you. some states, Decline, pace of decline may be different. Rate of decline may be slightly different. Otherwise, there is absolutely no point of making... Absolutely. And, and these are these are sustained the efforts that we've been talking yeah. about, Poonamji. That it's education, now, independence let, to let, women, yeah. the literacy let, levels let, rising in different states. These are factors which have played prominent roles in absolutely. bringing us to this landmark uh, yeah. numbers that we are talking about today. And, isn't and it? you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. this whole yeah, issue yeah. of raising... The Muslim, uh, it's no, almost no, like a fear psychosis that has been not. created in India, which we, this, that, that the, the Muslim growth rate is much higher than Hindus and they will overtake or their numbers will be huge. This has done a lot of damage in yeah. India and I think we have to stop Absolutely. and look at the data as Dr. Absolutely. Singh. So time is running out. I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of Perspective. Thank you, Dr. Bajaj, Professor Singh and Poonamji for joining me on the program today and sharing your perspective with us and our viewers. So that's it from us on Perspective today. Thanks very much for your time. See you again next time. Bye-bye.